Hey everybody, welcome to another episode of the Hazmat Guys, episode 200, and I cannot believe it, 87. Crazy. Uh, <laughs> Absolutely just, crazy. I can't, they, I, I think there's got to be people that say, please stop. The Hazmat <laughs> Yeah, everybody who emails us, please yeah. stop. <laughs> please, <laughs> hundreds of emails a week. Um, but we have an action-packed, uh, different format today, which kind of goes in with um, if you're on our YouTube channel, which you can find at the Hazmat Guys um, on YouTube. Uh, we are running the next series of shows live. Well, not live, but they're going to be um, video Recorded as well. Live. Yes, so we might have some re additional information um or if you want to see the the money makers that we got on our on our punums uh come on over to the youtube channel and check that out as well or hear us flub stuff and be like wait 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 hold on go back yeah that those are unedited right. <laughs> yes the videos are gonna <laughs> totally be totally unedited. unedited so every time i make a stupid mistake and bob goes no nah, you freaking idiot you can't say that and i go oh fine and then All we right. redo it <laughs> you get to hear it yes but um, as far as conferences, we have uh, coming up the Midwest Conference, which is going to be a video live kind of thing. I think that's in May time. So get your tickets for that one. Uh, also, we are doing Wisconsin. And then I think, and I'm pretty sure, I'm 99% sure Massachusetts is happening live September. Well, I, I'm I think we're just going to be up there anyway. Yes. <laughs> so there may not be a whole bunch of hazmat people, but we're going up and seeing our people up in whether whether there's a conference there or not. So you're more yes. than welcome to join us at the bar uh, in September when the conference was supposed to be, if it is not. Yeah. <laughs> so. And we, uh, we have the newsletter, right? Yes. So we we uh, get the, we're changing the format of the newsletter. Uh, we really, Bob and I sat down and we were like, all right, the newsletter, the newsletter, you know, the, the primary name in newsletter is news. So we really want the newsletter to be packed with stuff that is informational, not just from the hazmat guys, right? But from stuff that we have accumulated throughout the week, whether it's uh, things from Facebook, whether it's articles that have been written, whether it's something that somebody has contributed, uh, we want it to be a source of information, not just for us, uh, but also a mouthpiece for the community. So uh, the format's changing up a little. Head to the website and sign up for the newsletter to kind of get that additional information. Now, today's show kind of goes with that whole new format where we're trying new things out. I mean, I'm not going to say we got we got stale. But um, no, it's just it's no. you know, it's it's different. The the world of hazmat is is so vast and there's so many different angles to look at things from. And we're always looking for a fresh angle. And, you know, we try so hard to get people on the show and we totally understand social media policies make people so afraid uh, to do anything. I mean, look, just look at us. Right. We had to jump through hoops and get signed paperwork by who we work for to be able to even say that we work for them on this show. Uh, so we totally understand the hazmat Facebook page, the hazmat group two uh, hmm. is really a great place. People post information and we took, I took one of their posts. Unfortunately it got taken down. I don't know who it was. I don't know where it was, uh, but there was an ammonia leak in a, in a facility and they ended up going in, in a level B encapsulated suit. Now, I can tell you that I don't know all the information. I did not interview the person. I did not talk to them about it, but I did know that they were starting to kind of get hammered for it, uh, and the post ended up being taken down, which I have to tell you is a little upsetting for me uh, because, you know, we all learn from each other and we all make mistakes. I have had countless times that I've come on the show and been like, wow, did I screw this up? <laughs> and uh, I think that we should embrace that and not run away from it. But uh, then there was another post, and this is the only time I will drop the name. Uh, UG Nye, uh, I guess, found an article, posted it, and was like, hey, does anybody have information on this? Like, why did they do this? Da, da, da. And could we have done something a little bit better? And the the information that flowed out of that forum was phenomenal. So we took some of the posts, some of the comments, and we're going to literally talk about them and dissect them in this episode where, uh, you know, the good, the bad, the ugly. The one thing I will say, we are not using any names here. 
Okay. Uh, you're just going to have to trust us that the information that we pulled that we either agree with or didn't agree with came from reliable sources. Uh, mm-hmm. We didn't get permission to use people's names, so we're not going to do that. Uh, but we promise you, we're not going to give you some information from somebody that we don't know and trust. Right. So, all right. So set it up very generally. What okay. was the scenario? So in generally, there was an ammonia leak in a facility. I'm not even sure what kind of facility it was. And the responding units went in and they went in in a level B encapsulated suit. Uh, So uh, that was kind of the, that was really all that was given. I don't know what the amounts were. I don't know uh, if it reached LEL. I don't know if it reached PEL. I don't even know if it reached IDLH. Uh, That's all we kind of know. Uh, And there was, you know, Eugene had posted, he's like, hey, like, are we doing the right thing here? That was kind of the general gist of the post. Okay. And um, so I thought we would kind of start with how do we, me and Bob, because we have pretty similar ideology and how we pick our PPE, how right. would we go about determining what level PPE we would go in for an ammonia leak because I'll be honest with you again we're not Monday morning quarterbacking no. our opinion could be totally different like you may have a totally valid reason why you're going in at a level B encapsulated and that's fine for me a level B encapsulated uh, doesn't seem like the right suit and I am going to from this point forward try to change how I describe my PPE because I've started getting annoyed when people say well we're going to drop down a level right? Um, the levels ah. of PPE, the 1991, 93, and 94, they're not subgrades of each other, right? They are, they're perfectly suited for the for, mission at hand, for the mission at hand, right? Like, um, you know, we hear in decon sometimes, oh, the one level lower, right? But what is one level lower? Like a level B isn't less protection than a level A. It's just well, a different it is. level of protection. It is a lesser level as far as your protection, but I totally subscribe to what you're saying there is that it it's not a – I don't need as much protection. It's just that my mission doesn't require as much protection. Right. It's different. I'm protecting myself against something different. Right. So like a level B, I'm protecting against myself something different than a level A and a, and a 19 – or I guess we shouldn't even say that anymore. 1991 suit. I'm protecting myself different than a 93 suit and a 94 suit. I'm protecting myself different, you know, than is it? I'm sorry. Is it 92 or 93? 1991, 1991, 92 and 94, 94. Sorry. So 93 is the one that is no longer in existence. Right. So I think we need to stop thinking of things as like a lesser grade of protection and just a different type of protection, because even within that category, there are levels of protection based upon how that suit is created, where the zipper is, what it's designed for. So, um, yeah, that's right. I, I just I want to try to start to get away from that. I I, for, I I think I want to back up a couple of steps here in and kind of the encapsulated B. I don't think a lot of departments or or members that are in the hazmat community know even what an encapsulated B is. They think it's just a B. And there are two subsects of B. Um, one is the hooded, right? It goes up and your SCBA face piece goes on and the hood goes around your SCBA face piece. And the mission specific part of this thing is that my leak is generally below my nipple line, right? Mm-hmm. My leak is below me. When we would change over to an encapsulated B, which looks eerily like a level A, because the SCBA is on the inside, you got this hooded face piece around you, you're pretty much inside the suit. It isn't a level A, doesn't have the capabilities of a level A. It looks like it, but um, it is a splash protection suit. Now, again, nuance with this is that B, it means that you're unintentionally going to come in contact with liquid. A means I'm going to come into uh, contact with vapor or I'm going to intentionally I'm going to go swimming in a liquid, right? There, right. There's an argument to said there. With all that but, being said. But even, but even within the level B, right? So one of the things, if you go back to our, our acid shirt episode, mm-hmm. one of the things that we learned in that scenario when that happened to us is that even within the category of level B, 
there are suits that are good for the job and suits that are not good for the job. Yes. Right. So the in the scenario with the acid uh, from the battery, he was picking up the batteries and holding and carrying them. So naturally, they were resting on his chest and abdomen. Uh, covered in sulfuric acid, and the zipper was in the front. Mm -hmm. So, you know, he's not swimming in the product, but he started swimming in the product when they, he, they we then went through the archaic decon car wash system, <laughs> yes. right? And, and that ended up pushing it through the zipper, which was never designed to hold back liquids. Right. Versus like now we are starting to more think about the level B suits, uh, whether they're hooded or encapsulated, that zipper from the back. All right. Without reading these comments. Okay. One, my, one of my pet peeves about PP selection versus chemical, the actual chemical, is that I really, really, really disagree with people that say, well, you have this commodity – you will wear this suit. Oh, it's, right? it is. Yeah, I think we're both am, on the same page with that. I am 100% against this because I can modify the environment to do this. Now, it's very nice to say that from my, my cushy uh, seat right here, but it's always in the back of my mind that if I can change the environment, then I can modify my PPE to handle it. And I do it jokingly saying that if I stack enough fans behind me, blowing it away from me, I can take care of a leak with shorts and flip-flops. Right. Now, and can you build a scenario where B would be the proper PPE? Yes, I can. Did that scenario actually happen? I don't know. <laughs> yeah, and I, there are some commodities that you turn around and you're like, okay, well, I don't really understand that, right? Because uh, if a B is for splash protection, right, whether intentional, non-intentional, whatever, right. um, then – the commodity is ammonia, which mm -hmm. is a gas. Yes. So your B isn't doing anything to protect. Like there's no protection being offered by the B because the ammonia is a gas. So it, it, it almost becomes a, 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 a not choice. And the choices that, in my opinion, you have with an ammonia leak are bunker gear because there's an LEL. Or level A, because the concentration of the commodity is high enough to have an effect on your skin. Okay, I'm I'm going to throw a, one one uh, of our blue check marks. We'll say uh, made a good. A, I'm going to I'm going to use the, his comment as a pro B. I'm going to I'm going to quote in part, okay. and it says quote. Ammonia can be a nasty chemical to deal with, but it has a quality, a weakness, you could say, that we can leverage to our advantage, like kryptonite for Superman. That is water solubility. Ammonia is 34% soluble in water, meaning that we can use a fog spray to deal with all three of the gaseous hazards of ammonia, especially in confined spaces. The water will knock down the vapors, essentially ripping the cape off of Superman, mitigating the flammable atmosphere, and also the corrosive atmosphere. Now, that that is a next-level consideration, is that I'm going to be changing this. And I will add one more to this guy, is that the water, if properly applied, and maybe with the addition of a little bit of cloth, could form an ice plug around the leak, limiting the release and making all your problems into a liquid problem check the b suit i would agree with it hmm. all right that's you know what i was having a hard time thinking of when i would use a level b but that is of that's a pretty good because i wouldn't want to do that operation in bunker gear all right guys thanks for listening <laughs> <laughs> no no, no but it. like think about that right like so so what this gentleman is talking about, and again, this is a person that we know, and, and this is trusted. I would believe his information. I would definitely put this, uh, I never even thought about doing that in an ammonia situation, but it is totally viable. Now, I don't think I would do that in bunker gear because no. now I'm becoming soaked with water, and now anything that attaches to the atmosphere into my bunker gear is now a base in my bunker gear and on me. 
Right. And, and and truth be told, if you were to the solubility of 34%, yes, I can I can conclusively say that the ammonia will drop into solution for the most part, and it will drop down. However, when that ammonia goes into solution, now on the flip side of that, you're going to have an elevated vapor pressure of the ammonia coming out. And that's just evidenced by you opening up any jug of ammonia, and that smell is overpowering. That is just ammonia coming out of solution. So it's going to come back to get you, but it's in a more controlled environment. You do have the base. You do have all the other jazz. But, uh, you know, again, not on trade quarterbacking. I would say that is a – and it, it depends check mark. Right, right. It is definitely a tool in the toolbox that should be there and is a gr- – I think this is – I think this is probably one of the biggest takeaways from from this that I got w- was that one. And if you don't mind, let's just read the rest of Please. what he wrote because I think it, it lends to a tremendous amount of information. Okay. Uh, continuing on, right? He says the caustic liquid is much easier to deal with the ammonia in a gaseous state. He's 100% correct. Um, decon, if it is necessarily, is usually handled with plain water. Or a fan. I think, or a fan. I think I personally would, would uh, do the fan method or a wiping method. No fancy agents or techniques are needed. Monitoring for ammonia is relatively easy. He's 100% correct with this. Uh, the IDLH for ammonia is 300 parts per million. Now, remember... The 300 parts per million is when you're breathing it in, mm-hmm. okay? So uh, that determines your PPE and the tactics. A typical four gas meter will pick up on LEL sensor. However, it will not give a reading at or below the ideal H because the range is too high. 100% correct. Like it. pH paper will turn blue around two to five parts per million of ammonia in the air. That is the only part that I'm going to push back a little. Okay. Because I've been in ammonia atmospheres that were up to 150, 200 parts per million. We had wet pH paper, and they were not turning. Uh, and wow. we were using the PID. So um, I would say your pH paper is a better indicator of skin hazard than your PID. Would you disagree with that? I would absolutely say that because uh, if I have pH in air... I'm starting to really lean towards uh, higher levels of skin protection, namely level A. Don't say that word, level <laughs> A. <laughs> um, but I would say my PID has probably the best resolution of all my sensing capabilities. And I will throw one more meter out there that is at that part per million, if not parts per billion, is the AP4C will also pick up the ammonia as well. Yeah, in really, really, really small concentrations. Yes. Right, because with that, I mean, if you can't get something on your PID, you could probably definitely pick it up on your on your AP4C because it's just designed to go that low. Uh, he also mentions colometrics tubes. Yep. Um, but I have to tell you, from a, a first responder point of view, I don't really know why I would go in in that situation with a I think with a everybody on the tube. block is going to be telling you it's ammonia. Yeah. Yeah, I think there's no head fakes in that one. There's no <laughs> there's no scuttle in that smell. Definitely not. Um, one of the other interesting comments. Uh, it sounds like they were they were monitoring teams and levels were below the PEL, uh, meaning they could have just remained in turnout gear, uh, but they definitely didn't require traditional level A suit. So this is a person who must have had a little bit more information, and I believe somewhere somebody quotes it as uh, 24 parts per million on the PID. Okay, so that is definitely, as far as I am concerned, a, a really low amount. Um, I don't even think that the the PEL is is around there. I think at twenty four parts per million, even in industry, you would be allowed to walk in there without any kind of respiratory protection. Huh. If it's if it's below yeah. if it's below the PEL, and I don't know for sure if it is, but I'm, I'm I think that it is that 24 is below the PEL. Uh, So, I mean, we're definitely outside the range of a level A suit. Uh, Then the question is, do you think you need to decommission the turnout gear if it was used in that situation? Uh, And this uh, commenter, she responds, no, ammonia at low levels on turnout gear, uh, it doesn't harm it. Uh, It just needs to be put in front of fans prior to being reused uh, so that the gas can blow right off. which is unlike chlorine yes which is is degrading to nomex 
uh, which is the typical component of fire gear. And that's why they generally frown on, again, this is coming from that same person, is why they frown on the chlorinated uh, bleaching, if you would, of the laundering of, of gear. You have to use special soaps. And, um, and again, we, you know, the hazmat guys do put out a full line of decon soaps that smell like musty hay or germaniums. <laughs> I uh, like the almonds. Garlic. <laughs> yeah. uh, it is a hot seller, and you can find it online at thehazmatguys.com. Excellent stuff. And that is, that is backed up by science, right? So yes. uh, the commenters in this thread, they referenced the jackrabbit testing. Yes. Uh, where they dressed out mannequins in turnout gear, SCBA, and this was on the top of a cargo. They were exposed at least five times to extremely high concentrations of chlorine during the five to ten ton releases. They both held up well, uh, but then uh, the comment from that is, yes, the gas exposure is generally easier to mitigate out of the turnout gear with chlorine in particular, though it can degrade the fibers on the Nomex and the material levels and greatly reduce their longevity, which is obviously uh, without strength testing. This is one reason that chlorinated cleaners are not used in the, the laundering of the gear. So uh, another interesting point of view, right? We often, I feel like we often put ammonia and chlorine kind of like together in a lot of the responses, right? And I think that's more from, in, from instructors like drilling, like we want uh, a gas that people are going to go into a level A for. So we either choose ammonia or we choose chlorine because it's so common. Um, but here is a really good example where because of that, of the the nature of one versus the other, we wouldn't want to go in and, in our turnout gear uh, in levels of high concentration. So I think that's uh, th that was an interesting thing. Yeah. And, and you know what? And also, you got to remember that each each level of PPE is – rated or or let's say better not it's tested to a certain threshold of parts per million exposure right and this goes back to like it's not really on topic for this thing but you know uh, one of the biggest i think misconceptions of responders is that if they get into a suit they handle an operation to come out and get the best decon known to man and they get out of the suit that they're clean that is not how suits work and yeah. so each suit has a certain permeation time and each suit, let's say the level A, which I believe is 100,000 parts per million, level B is like 10,000 parts per million. Um, I, I could be wrong with those numbers, but I think the level B is 10,000 parts per million is all that chemical is coming through the suit. And when the dummy that's in there has sensors all over it, when one of those sensors hits that 10,000 parts per million, they literally stop the clock and that's where they get the time from. And so you are getting dirty as you are exposed to you know stuff. So that's why that's the that is really the driving force of what PPE you pick. We we redetermine it as because it's easier to consume is mission. What's your mission? Meaning, am I going to be farther away from the leak or am I going to be up and in the leak? Exposure higher, right? So. You know, yes, the skin absorption, uh, absorption and the flammability and all that shit all kind of comes together. But if I'm in a level A, my mission is to get up and in it, meaning I'm going to have a higher level exposure, meaning I need a higher level of protection. B means I'm accidentally getting into it, meaning I'm trying not to get up that, that level. And so there are interpretation letters on this. I'm going to see if I can pull up this interpretation because there's a, a lively section of this thing where uh, I'm going to quote in part uh, one gentleman that says, in turnout gear or level B, you get up to about 10,000 parts per million, then you start to feel the skin irritation. And that all, I'm not quoting anymore, that all comes from the ammonia turning, the anhydrous ammonia turning with the sweat on your body into ammonium hydroxide, which is a strong base. Right. Requoting now, an old OSHA interpretation letter recommends using level B up to 5,000 parts per million. Based on the logic, it's half the irritation level. Others in the ammonia industry are using 10,000 or 15,000 as a trigger to upgrade from B to A. So uh, I'm going to pull up this letter. I'm going to see if I can get it. It's right from the OSHA standard. It is from 1991. So uh, I think a few things have changed since then. I will I, say phones and faxes, <laughs> <laughs> and the, the and and but that goes back to the my whole thought process of you know um, 
if you're not going in there with a hose line to knock down the vapors, why would they be in a level B at all? Like, what exactly are they looking to protect? And don't forget, when they say 10,000 parts per million in bunker gear without getting burned, they're not taking into account your neck and head, which are not in bunker gear. Yes. Okay. I have the 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 uh, letter of interpretation. Question okay. is, and this is I'm quoting directly. Question is, at what parts per million level of exposure would you expect the person that responded to an ammonia leak use a level A suit? Response: Generally, we would expect emergency responders to respond to level A suits to unknown concentration levels at levels at or above one half of the immediate dangerous to life or health ideal age. The ideal H level for ammonia is 300 parts per million, and one half of that is 150 parts per million. However, ammonia is an inhalation hazard at 1,000 parts per million and not a skin absorption hazard. Ammonia begins to affect the moist skin at exposures greater than 10,000 parts per million, which is 1%, uh, which would give you mild irritation, and at a concentration greater than 300, I'm sorry, 30,000 parts per million, which is 3%, a stinging sensation is observed. Therefore, the general procedure to use level A equipment is half the ideal H may be unduly conservative for ammonia exposures. For ammonia, it may be more appropriate to respond to the level A gear with half of the threshold to skin irritation or 5,000 parts per million. I, all right, so let's just, well, let's, let's examine that for a little bit, right? Yep. That letter was written back in 91, Mm -hmm. where pretty much everything was done in a level A, right? That was kind of the general consensus. We've come a long way in 30 years, um, and I would absolutely agree more with the skin irritation versus the whole, like, ideal H thing. Yep. Because I think really understanding that you start to get irritation at 10,000 parts per million that's really the the key, right? Because that's that's when the pH paper is going to turn. That's when you're going to start to get the burning sensation. That's when we're looking to protect ourselves against the commodity, right? Because we often ask ourselves, how are we protecting ourselves from the commodity? Well, if the commodity doesn't start to burn us till 10,000 parts per million, and mm-hmm. even that is a light skin irritation, then what are we really doing in a level B to begin with, what are we doing in, in, you know, like, why are we wearing what we're wearing, I guess, is, is, you know, the, the, the question that we're, that we're posing. Um, so I don't know. I, I don't, I guess as I'm sitting here thinking about it, there's a part of me that says, well, Mike, you're fat. And (laughs) what if it's summertime? And you have the choice between, you know, it's like 5,000 parts per million. So I don't have a skin irritation. Um, I can't go in there in shorts and a flip flops because the chief will actually lose his mind. Uh, So I have to wear something. Do I wear bunker gear and sweat my fat ass off? Or do I wear a level B or possibly a 1994 suit and be a little bit more comfortable uh, in in what I'm doing. I would think, I would think with any one of those three, that if you picked the bunker gear, let's say something went sideways in any one of those three scenarios, you would have some justification to do. Like if you went in bunker gear at levels that say at or around 5,000 parts per million and something went wrong with you specifically, uh, you would have some explaining to do well, what your justification would be. And I'm wearing the bunker gear or wearing bunker the gear. B? Let's talk about B or even 94 because the generality of, of 94 suits is my mission is to move people. My B suits is for a liquid spill. What I'm saying is, well, I would well, think, hold, hold on. on. The, the, okay. What I'm saying is, I would think that I would be comfortable justifying my position i think a lot of people out there would not be comfortable justifying it and saying i'll be successful they would just opt for the level a and just call it a day Hmm. because you know you can't be faulted well you can be but forget that you can't be faulted for upgrading your level your level of protection to the level a because it's very easy to justify well this that and the other thing 
based upon my schooling. I think you would have to be like a level 10 instructor level kind of guy to say, well, this is why I went shorts and flip flops. I say it funny, but I think I can justify it out if when push comes to shove and somebody get hurt. Oh, absolutely. Because neither one of us is going to jump into a gear that we can't justify. Right. Um, yeah. But so I just want to the you had said the 94 was mission specific for dragging bodies in life. I just want to be clear for where we work. That is they have determined our authority having jurisdiction has determined that a 1994 suit. That's what we're using it for. Yes. Uh, uh, yes. Across I, I'm not going to say that's generality. Yeah. Right. right. It's across, not a true. Right. Across the country, it is just designed as another suit to protect in certain scenarios. Um, and we are given in, in my actual our company of specialists uh, are given free reign to use that suit as we determine it. Um, it is often used for life safety, but it absolutely can be used in in place of a level B and in if you can justify it in place of a level A. Yeah, I often use it when I run out of clothes at home. I just jump in it and it's it is good <laughs> enough to run around town and it gets a couple looks, but uh, yeah, uh, the kids love it. Okay, so there's the last part of the discussion. We're kind of oh, we're we're pretty close to our time. All right, let's let's talk about this anyway. Um, so you guys are getting an extra few free minutes on this one uh, because we're talking the low end. Now let's jump up to the higher end, right, mm -hmm. where we start looking at LEL levels. There is a piece of this discussion that talks about, well, if you're going to go in, are you going to go in in a flash suit, wearing a flash suit, which is a very old style comment because – Yes. Flash suits were used, you know, the, the kind of whole idea of the flash suit was when there were two piece suits, uh, manufacturers with one suit could not fit into the 1991 standard. So they created a second suit. It's really an abrasion suit that had flash protection over it. And the flash protection, I believe, was even optional. Uh, yes. It was an optional uh, thing. for. It was guys. mostly a marketing ploy to say, oh, look, you have flash, but it was really for abrasion. Right. And the flash was not to protect the person inside the suit. The flash said that if this was involved in a two to five second flash, it would still not permeate the chemical. Right. Didn't say you won't be burned to death inside the suit. <laughs> yes. <laughs> like a burrito. So, yeah, which is often something people think of. They're like, oh, this is going to protect me. No, it's not going to protect you from the flash. It's not going to protect you from the heat. Uh, you're still going to the burn center. Uh, you just won't be going to the burn center with chemical burns. Yes. All right, so they started talking about wearing FR coverings under the plastic suit. One person says that it is useless. Uh, it increases the workload on the technician entering the environment. I think you could argue that the team was made appropriate choices uh, given their initial information. He's talking about uh, what they chose. He's agreeing with their level of protection. Structural turnout gear probably would have been fine given those readings. Level A for a response to a generally unknown Intervention on chemicals with a high vapor pressure, such as a TIH or PIH chemical, or the rare combination of both. In rare instances that you have both, the Kapler 500 suit is out there. Again, wearing two suits is useless. Do the research. Pick the highest risk. Dress accordingly. I do kind of agree with, with that last statement. Um, and then an extremely trusted source replies back that uh, in the Shreveport incident, uh, somebody told them, uh, and I don't know that person, so I, I can't deem them as uh, somebody that is reliable. They may or may not be. Uh, that they removed the outer flash based upon the research. But he said that had they worn the flash suit, in his opinion, they would have not been burned over 80%. And the one gentleman that died would have lived. Uh, having said that, the Kapler Frontline 500 is a better option than a two-layer suit but I would still opt to change the atmosphere. So here we have people kind of in uh, agreeance that, listen, you're still going to get burned with the flash suit on. It may be less, but it's still, it is not something you want to consider to be um, protection against fire. And that's the point that I really wanted to drive home is that um, when you have something, don't think, oh, well, these are flash rated, that that means that you can go in and, be in an explosive environment, um, it's not going to turn out well for you.